My name is Dr. Tracy Davis. I have been here for 19 years this year. I had loved my time here at Blackhawk as a student, and so I sent a cold letter just saying, hey, I'm in town, I don't know if you all would ever need an adjunct, but I can adjunct, so if it's something that would be interesting, and I didn't hear anything back for a long time. And then one day I just got a call, and it was a person saying, we have someone leaving uh, in two weeks, and uh, they're full-time. So how would you feel about being a full-time faculty member? And I had taught graduate students, but I had never taught undergraduates before. And uh, so I panicked because it's, it's a little bit of a different thing. Uh, and, and I said, uh, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I'll, I'll see uh, what I can do. And I um, never, you know, never trained to teach. And so I kind of wondered how it would be to be in the classroom. And I walked in that first day and I taught two classes on the first day and then kind of sat in my office after and thought, um, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. I mean, I, I really feel like this is sort of fulfilling a calling I guess I didn't, hadn't even heard before that day. I spent a lot of time as a culture talking about how difficult it was for students to go through COVID. And I guess what I'd like for everyone to know is uh, professors also really struggled. Teaching on Zoom is very different than teaching in the classroom. Learning on Zoom is very different than learning in the classroom, and I think that there is a lot of research going on about what that did you know, to students, basically. But I mean, I watched students in their homes basically attending my class. And occasionally, a family member would walk through and like sit down and like have questions, and you know, it was just a very different experience. So this particular class, everyone was really great. They all turned their cameras on, and there was one um, student who, was just playing guitar the whole time. So he's on mute, right? So I can't hear anything he's playing, but he's very clearly just, you know. And so at some point, um, weeks after this had happened, I asked him like, "Is are you playing a soundtrack for me? Or are you practicing? Like, you know, what what's happening? And he said he really enjoys playing guitar while he's listening to lecture because it centers him in a different way. and. Honestly, for that student in the classroom, there's really no way for him to play guitar in a classroom while listening to a lecture in real time. So he got to have a completely different experience, right? Okay, so in this same class, another student's little square, Zoom square pops up, and it's just him, but like from profile. And I said, are, are you okay? And I, he turns and I can see he's got his earbuds in. And he said, um, yeah, I'm in a duck blind. And I was like, what? And he was like, I'm in a duck blind with my dad. And I was like, oh, okay. He said, I'm going away to school. And uh, this is the last year. We always do opening day together. And this is the last year we're gonna do it. And he said, I think, I think Davis will be cool. I'll just go to class in a duck blind. It'll be fine. And so I said, but I'm, I'm in your ears, right? And he's like, yeah, the ducks can't hear you. Like, I mean, it was really, it was very, we, we talked all the way through it because I didn't want to ruin his experience. And um, we got done. I said, because I always end class with, does anyone have any questions? Nobody did. And then slowly they just kind of disappeared. And I'm standing, I'm sitting in my own dining room looking at my screen and I open up a Word document and I just type, dear freshman, because what I figured out, I think sort of along the way, but especially in that moment, is there are so many soft social skills that people learn as they're going to school. And if they weren't going to school, they weren't gonna pick up those skills. There was just gonna be no event where we were gonna be able to kind of fill in everything that they had missed. I typed that first day, probably about five pages out, and I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe I'll append it to the you know, syllabus or maybe whatever, but like it's not gonna go anywhere. Like it's just five pages of things I wish freshmen would read about. And I didn't really fool myself into believing that freshmen would read an extra five pages. Like I'm sort of like aware of how difficult it is even to get them to read the syllabus. So um, I, that interesting. So I got up the next day, did the same thing, taught a Zoom class. And I thought, you know, there's like three or four more things I think I could really, you know, put, put into, this, into this Word document. It got up to around 30, 40 pages, and I thought, it's a book now. It's, it's, not, it's not just something that would be great for people to know. It's something I need to put into the hands of freshmen so when they walk in, 
they understand that the transition that they would normally experience from high school to college, because it was not normative, there was a bunch of stuff that they're gonna miss. I finished it up. I didn't tell anybody about it at all. I got to the end and I sent it to two other faculty members. One faculty member who I knew would be sweet no matter how awful it was, right? Like I just, I needed someone to be like, you've spent months on this, it's great. Um, and then someone who I knew would be super critical if it was awful. So uh, it's about a week later, um, of course, I, I heard almost immediately from the person who was giving me the pat on the back, this is so great, oh my gosh. Well, I'm like, okay, thank you, that's, that's, thank you, that's wonderful. So uh, the person who I know is gonna be super critical doesn't call, I don't hear anything. And it's a very different form of vulnerability than I'm used to at work because we talk all the time about our teaching practices, but there's just a lot of me in this book. There's a lot of how I was when I was a, a Blackhawk freshman, the way that I struggled even though I had not been through anything like COVID. So this person calls and I see their name on the phone and I'm like, all right, just dig in, like dig deep, you gotta brace yourself. So I pick up, this is how I answer the phone. How bad is it? Um, and so she says, I wanna read you something. And she reads me like two or three sentences from the book. And um, I didn't say anything, and she said, I need every freshman to read this. After that, I knew it was gonna go. Uh, and I had it go through a couple rounds of editing. Um, five people looked at it. One person who's not at all in academia and hasn't been in college for a really long time. And then four faculty members uh, who teach different subjects to different students at different times, that kind of thing. And they all had sort of their own perspective, but what was most interesting to me in the editing process was the amount that the feedback overlapped. Um, we're all seeing students really struggle reading textbooks. We're all seeing students really struggle to get through the syllabus and then to understand sort of independently what a rubric was. So just things that we need to teach people about I guess the structure of college that's gonna make it easier for them to get through. Um, I am currently enrolled in a master's program to do uh, creative writing and somewhat sort of like just serendipity, at that point they were giving us these sort of um, links about like, if you wanna self publish or whatever, here are some people who will help you do that. I got connected with a person who just, fantastic. I mean, just wonderful. Um, has done a lot of publishing for publishing companies, but also the self-publishing route. And she really walked me through the rest of the way. I have had freshman students who have read the book say to me, um, your life when you were 18 is like my life now. And I always ask them, does that surprise you? And they're like, yeah, because I think they assume that we're sort of fully formed nerds, like from birth, we're just like chunked out of a machine. And so the idea that I struggled academically in high school, did not think about myself as a good student. Um, my high school counselor told me I should lay concrete for a living because I was not bright enough to go to college and that I mean, it was just every person I talked to said, you know, you gotta figure out who you are right now, even though you don't know anything about yourself. And I think without Blackhawk, I wouldn't have really sort of aligned with the trail I needed in order to understand my own potential and then be able to make that. And I think that's still what students are doing today. I mean, that's, you know, decades ago now. But the student that walks in today is still the first generation student, not academically strong. They have doubts about whether or not they can make it. They feel like maybe they don't fit here because either no one in their family has gone to college or they're the first person to really think it's a good idea to go to college. And in a lot of ways, that's my story. Um, and so they're doing the same thing. The difference now is, you know, they're doing it with maybe fewer skills 
that I think we were just given because the assumption is we would all go to college. Um, and, I, and so I think that it's, it's helpful to be able to have a little bit of information here and there that kind of round, rounds out the edges. Um, because if you understand how the buildings are set up on campus, maybe that's all it takes for you to feel like you do belong here, yeah. I think uh, college is really expensive. And I think if you can figure out sort of like the 10 things you need to do in order to be able to get the most information that you can for the money that you put in, um, that's a good idea. I always ask students, um, if, if I came to you the day before classes and I handed you a document that told you how to be successful in the class, would you read it? And they're like, yeah, of course, why would you not read that? I mean, it makes the most sense to do it. And I'm like, okay, that's the syllabus. So please read the syllabus, but they don't read the syllabus. And I know they don't because at the very bottom of all my syllabi, it says when you reach the end of the syllabus, please email me at the following email address and they just don't. Um, so I know they don't make it that far. And look, the syllabus is not compelling reading. I, I, I get it. Like, it doesn't matter how many times I rewrite it. It's just going to be like reading stereo instructions. It's, it's just how it is. So reading the syllabus is a good idea. Learning how to communicate with your professor by email in a formal way, and I have a whole chapter about that, is a good idea. Because no matter if you're coming in person, hybrid, dual, online, you're going to have to email your professor at some point. Knowing how to do that and understanding that professors have discretion. So if you're emailing them a problem and you've already read the syllabus and you can say, I've already read the syllabus, but there's no guidance for my question. So here is the solution that I'm offering. That's great because then we know what you can or can't do. We've efficiently figured out how to move you forward. And also there comes a time for a lot of people where they're like, I think this is the time I have to drop. And as a professor, I think the thing that is the most frustrating, it doesn't even happen in the classroom. It happens five years later when I'm like standing behind you in line at the Wendy's and you're like, I remember you from Blackhawk. Hi, how are you? And I say, good. And I say, what happened to you? You disappeared. And they say, oh, something came up and then I wasn't able to complete. And through their description, I realized if they just would have emailed me, we could have, we could have actually you know, helped them get to graduation. So sometimes you don't know when to ask. Sometimes you know when to ask, but you don't know what to ask. And so I think it just helps those questions. Who do I go to if I'm, I'm curious about registering, but I don't know what classes I need? You know, what is a registrar? I mean, that's a weird word, right? I mean, like just a, so like so mu many of the words that we have, so much of the vernacular, I think that we, we sort of work through. Uh, on the campus, we don't really teach it to students. So we tell students, you know, if you have a complaint about a faculty member, you know, you go to that person's chair and they're like, chair? You know, I mean, because it doesn't make sense, right? It just, it's not a word that I think you would use otherwise for that, for that reason. And so it, it answers those questions and it helps students to understand that they have responsibilities as a student, but it also helps them figure out what their resources are there are places in the book where they can write out the answers to what are your resources. Um, your resources change as you're going through. When I was first a freshman, I needed very different resources than when I was a junior because what was expected of me was different and so the resources I tapped were different. Um, I always tell the students there's no look of regret that is worse than you're in your final term at Blackhawk and you're like, wait, we have a writing center? You know, like, because it just never occurred to you to look around. So if someone's gonna offer you a tour, take them up on it. When you go to a place where you're like, I definitely have to find my way back here, write it down. Um, if you know that there's something that strategically is making it so you cannot be successful, um, my laptop busted and it's rent or a laptop and I gotta pay rent because I can't be homeless. Um, figure out whether or not you know your institution has a laptop program. Blackhawk does. There are a lot of students who don't know that and so they're trying to go to the library after work and before they have to pick up their kids and kind of like trying to sneak in quizzing and stuff and I think it makes it more complicated than it needs to be for some folks. I, as people are reading it they're giving me feedback on it 
And the feedback that I'm getting is in the form of a, hey, did you think about, and then it's like a series of things that they think would be great, a great additions. And almost all of those belong here. So, you know, I mean, I'm not getting a lot of stuff that's not, you know, sort of germane to what I'm, what I'm looking to do. But I don't want to make it so long that students are like, yep, still not interested. It's just a syllabus, but with chapters. I'm not, no, thank you. I'm not really interested in doing that. Uh, and so for me, I think what I would like to do is I would like to keep it as short as possible, but reflecting current circumstances. We bring people together. Um, education happens here, but also just, you know, cr the creation of human relationships uh, where people want the same thing. And I feel really lucky to be able to watch that happen all the time. I remind myself sometimes, because this is my workplace, like I walk in here and like I work here, right? So I'm thinking about all the stuff I have to do. And I'll see two students having an argument about something, and but they're arguing something that they've learned about. And I just can't help but smile. Like that, that is something that we've worked together so that they can do. And uh, I hope we can do that a lot into the future. And I hope that a lot of that stuff can actually go into this book. It means I'm gonna have to take some stuff out. I'm committed to not making it a lot longer. Um, so cutting some pieces that maybe aren't necessarily gonna continue to resonate with students in order to make some room for that. Um, and then maybe the, the book can keep growing as the freshmen change.